Good evening, everyone. We would like to start this event, and um, we would like to start it with a poem that we both took the time to write. So, let's As a kid, remember laughing, smiling, having the time of your life where life was simple and didn't have to worry about anything. As a kid, remember Thanksgiving, food, family, and more food on a family's beautiful dinner table. As a kid, remember waking up in the middle of the night, the gunshots, and mom screaming, let's go, let's go, let's go, they're coming. As a child, remember walking in the desert, no food, no shelter, no water, in the hopes of finding a better life. Remember walking in the desert, no food, no water, no shelter, in hopes of finding a better life under a big, beautiful blue sky. Are you and I any different from that kid? Well, I'm not a criminal. The skin I wear isn't a weapon. The dress I wear isn't a threat. The language I speak isn't an insult. The religion I practice isn't a passage to a potential terrorist attack. You and I are no different. You and I have something in common, even if it's not religion or color or language. We were all kids at some points in life, kids with shared hopes, imaginations, and same future, I mean same future, and some futures. Once upon a time, we were kids. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank everyone of you for taking the time to come and be a part of this event. We have so many guests here, amazing guests, by the way, <laughs> with us tonight. But first, I would like to take the opportunity to take the organization and individuals that made this made tonight possible. And Welcoming Fargo Moorhead. And a special thanks to the human family, which is Sean, for making this happen. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And also, we would like to give a big shout out and also um, thank Hukun for making this all happen. This would have never you know, happened without him being here. The passion he has for this, um, what's it called, organization is just mind blowing. And I would like to just, you know, appreciate him for opening the door for us. And then right now, all we really want to do is to get our community together and to all come together as one and, you know, just share, Unite. Our, yeah, just share stories. Um, and then, uh, be the face of our community, basically, instead of you know letting the internet um, determine us or you know the way you know the internet comes. So, Stereotypes, basically. Yeah, basically. So I would like to have our host Hukun here with us. So if you'd like to join us, it would be. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for here, and uh, Amina. And we don't want to forget uh, Sean Kaufman, who is one of our partners. Uh, Sean did also uh, wonderful work in this event, and he's the one also who organized, who was contacting and, uh, our visitors from Minneapolis uh, every day. So please uh, give a round of applause to Sean, too. <laughs> And our staff too, uh, who did great work, and Kani Aden, and uh, Kani Aden for here, and Amina too, was uh, trying to contact the community to, see, uh, to come and see uh, our, extra our extraordinary guests uh, who are here tonight. Please give them a round of applause too. <laughs> so now um, we want to invite our mayor to come and say hi to you guys and we'll come to you uh, tomorrow. Head. I'm gonna be real quick. I, I, I just want to thank those from the cities that have come out here to have this dialogue. Thank you, Halkoon, for, for uh, coordinating that and, and the organizations that brought them here. I think this idea of having a good discussion about how it impacts everyone in Minnesota and how we can have 
good conversations about how we can best be part of the community, how, how uh, we can be more welcoming, and uh, particularly in this week, because we're starting Welcoming Week in our community pretty soon. And so th this is a, a great opportunity, and uh, I just want to, uh, um, again, welcome those that are visiting, and uh, thank you for those in our community, and quite a few of them from here that are here to come listen. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as the Mayor said, this week is the welcoming week. So now I would like to invite our guest. And so audience from Moorhead, we, wanna, we want to give them our audience a welcoming face. So please welcome them. So let me start with Mahmoud Noor. Please welcome. And our next, Mohamed Farah, who's here. <laughs> Sheikh Abdi, please welcome. Eke <laughs> Hassan. And last, Hodan Hassan. Please have a seat. They're not brothers. Okay, another. <laughs> so we wanted to have one-on-one -on -one conversation, but uh, we look on the time and we say, you know, let's have a panel, right? So we'll going to uh, engage with our panel and then uh, also later uh, on the audience. So now and. Uh, before I start, so I'll give each uh, of the panel two minutes to introduce themselves and tell them who you are, right? Tell them who they are. Please welcome to Moret. Let me start with Eke Hassan. Please. Tell us who you are, Eke. I'm more like an acti active guy, so I bike. Uh, I just don't like you know, sitting down, so don't mind. If you want to sit down, you can sit down, one of you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Eke Hassan. I'm, uh, uh, Minneapolis Park Board Commissioner from the District 3. I won uh, a long, uh, long campaign last year and some of the candidates who are sitting in the room can feel what that means and the work you know, that entails. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Jonathan who's running for mayor. So, uh, I heard a lot of good things about him. I'm not saying vote for him, but he's a great guy. <laughs> and Otherwise, and I'm happy to be here. I worked, you know, with uh, the DFL. I'm also the chair of the DFL Somali American Caucus, and I'm happy to be with all of you. Hello, everyone. Salam alaikum. Uh, my name is Horan Hassan. I am from Minneapolis. Um, by trade, I'm a social worker. I'm a community activist, um, and I recently won the primary election for um, Minnesota House, District 62A, which is South Minneapolis, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Sheikh Abdi. I'm an uh, activist myself. I'm uh, a father. I'm a community organizer. Title is not that important, but we here, uh, we were the one of the people who make our community difference, and we're proud of it, and we're proud of you, Moorhead, and we are happy to be here today. Uh, Salam alaikum. Uh, my name is Mohammed Farah. I am, I don't have the, the, the big resume that these folks have, uh, but first of all, I want to say thank you so much to. Uh, uh, Hakun uh, and uh, his organization and all the folks that really have been part of this uh, planning this amazing event. Uh, thank you so much. It's my first time uh, being uh, coming to, to this side of the world in Moorhead. Uh, amazing place uh, so far. Uh, but again, my name is Mohamed Farah. I am uh, the executive director of a local nonprofit youth development organization that's called Kajog. Um, and I have been involved in community development or community work for over over 10 years, uh, that, that's who I am. I love giving back and, and making impact in, in various different communities. And I'll tell you more about it later, but thank you so much. Good evening, uh, Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, 
it's great honor to be with all of you here today. Um, thank you so much, Hukun and Sean and everybody who could make this event really um, beautiful and how it is. And thank you so much for your hospitality. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Nur. I'm, uh, I've served as the executive director of the Confederation of Somali Community in Minnesota, one of the oldest entity uh, that has helped so many people uh, resettle in the state of Minnesota. Uh, as this week is the week of welcoming week, uh, we have to look back where we came from and how did we end up here. And part of the discussion is who are you? And to go into the details, you know, my background is computer science. I've worked for the state of Minnesota for more than 10 years. I was the system administrator for the statewide systems. I've been, uh, you know, uh, very lucky to have been the person who has been involved in the systems that issues benefits. Uh, I was part of the team that built the child care system from the ground up. And uh, I've worked for Hennepin County, uh, issuing benefits and being a planning analyst. I'm a, form, I'm a former also board of directors in Minneapolis Public Schools. Uh, Mohammed, I don't have uh, that big resume, but uh, I've also been somebody who has been involved in politics. And I just won the race for District 60B, uh, which is in Minneapolis. And I look forward to the discussion this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, all of you. So we have a five question, and uh, we'll ask each one of you. So let me start with the first question, and AK will go first, always, right? So how will you describe your life story? What brought you to the moment you live today? I think you planned this, Hukun, but it's okay. I'll handle this, guys. <laughs> uh, well, uh, that's a great question, and I'm happy to answer. I, I think I've always wanted to be a police officer and uh, want to give back to the community in some way, but I've never thought about any, you know, politics, running for office. But there was a time that I participated in Minnesota Youth in Government uh, where I authored a bill about transportation, the bill of uh, the purpose of the bill was having heated and enclosure for every bus stops in Minnesota, and immigrants and people who depend on public transit can feel the pain and how what it takes to depend on uh, buses and the public transit in our state and uh, in our local cities. So I, at the time I was a, I was in high school, uh, depend on public transit every time after high school. I mean after school programs, uh, it will take me. 20, 30 minutes to catch the bus. And uh, you know how, you know, when it gets in the winter time, the buses got delayed. And the first issue that came to my mind when I was writing this bill was, how can I change? What can I do? And then I sat down, I went home, thought about it, and I said, why don't I change something about uh, our transportation system in Minnesota? I came back the next day, authored the bill to create shelters in, the bu in every bus stops. The bill went to the House and uh, the, through Minnesota Youth in Government, and then it was passed by the House because I convinced them. But when it got to the Senate, uh, it was rejected by uh, the Finance Committee because, you know, finance money and how uh, they decide what, how the money can be used in our state. And after approximately 40 minutes of debate, there was no way that I couldn't push because pe people who were debating said, why don't we use this money in our education system? And instead of uh, building shelters, that can be destroyed by the homeless and the drug dealers. Well, homeless means, you know, like if we are saying the homeless is a problem, I think we should thought about it, what it feels to be human. And then when we talk about the drug dealers, we should put our shoes in, the, in those people. So I, I debated the bill, and there was no way I could have pushed because as an immigrant, someone who benefits uh, from the education system in this country, I said, I'll amend this bill, and I need some further time. However, the bill, you know, the bill got destroyed there, but I want to amend this bill one day and reinforce this time corporates. And 
like cab food, targets, big corporates that you know benefit from us, but that does that don't contribute back to the community and consumers. My mom worked in the Target for a long time. She still works there as a, I say, you know, what is it, assembly. But uh, however, my mom depends on public transport. Another time I used to depend on public transport. So do I still. But this time I, I want to make sure this bill, you know, uh, what is it, uh, reinforce the corporates to pay every bus shelters that are nearby or next to them. Because what about the, you know, like the, you know, the employees? That just shows they don't care about them. My mom waits, you know, the buses, you know, like now she doesn't, but what about those who can't afford, you know, who, can't, who doesn't have, uh, who depends on public transit? So this bill actually gave me, inspired me to run for office and to be the change that I wanted to see. I got involved in my neighborhood, went to, you know, my first precinct caucuses, become a delegate, and worked in my first campaigns, and then moved on. To be, uh, to be the chair of the DFL Somali Caucus. And then last year I decided to run for office. And, but that was the bill that helped me and inspired me because I learned what it takes to change. I learned the hard work that people go through. And I also want to give a shout out to uh, Representative Ben Lin that's sitting here who sits in the Senate. I mean, the House. Give him a hand, guys. Come on. It's those kind of leaders that make a difference and that believe in that wake up one day and say, I want to change. You know, it takes him a long time to get to you know, the state, you know, three hours, you know, four hours. Sometimes to go there, he ran not just to an interest that he had, but an interest of everyone. But, you know, that was the bill that inspired me and that, that was the issue that helped me get elected and, I mean, run and be the change that I wanted to see. Thank you, AK. Okay. So what was, Again, what was the, the question? The question was, how will you describe your life story? What brought you to the moment you live today? Um, that's, uh, that's a hard one. Um, I'm um, a former refugee. Um, I fled from war and came to this country uh, 20 plus years ago seeking for a better life. Um, and one of the profound moments of my story um, that shaped my life the way it is, is um, I remember as a kid, when we arrived at the airport, uh, there was a group of people from Lutheran Social Services that welcomed us at the airport. So for me as a kid, I could not understand why strangers wanted to welcome us. I kept asking my mother who these people are and why do they care about us? Um, and that you know, moment impacted me to go into service and serving others. So when it was time to go to college, I decided to do social work um, and you know, work and give back to my community so that's that's a moment that shaped my worldview of, you know, I'm still giving back to those strangers that gave us a chance and helped us, you know, learn how to do grocery shopping, how to ride the bus, how to do these things, all of these, you know, uh, tasks that were normal for the average American and that are normal for me right now, but weren't normal and um, easy to learn. 20 something years ago and even today I'm, I'm, I'm still giving back um, so about a year ago I decided to run for an office and well 2016 happened first of all um, all our nightmares became reality um, so after 2016 happened it left me with more questions than answers so how do I make change what do I do um, I knew that I didn't have the luxury of sitting around and hoping that someone else is going to step up to the plate, uh, but I didn't know which direction I was going to, to go. And then my state rep, who has been serving my district for 38 years, announced that she was retiring. And you know, some of the people that I've worked with um, 
that knew my work, that knew that I was in, in search of like, what, how do I make impact or how do I make change, called me and they were like, well, here's your answer, go, <laughs> run. It was not an easy decision, but it was one of the um, you know, most influential moments of my life, other than you know, the day that I arrived in this country. I have grown in the last eight months. It's been a hard campaign. I was in primary for five, you know, five individuals, but it, it helped me grow. It, it, it you know, gave me perspective of like understanding the district, understanding the needs of the people, and also understanding how when I put my name on the ballot, I didn't know, you know, whether, uh, I, how serious I was, but this gave me, um, you know, yes, I want to do this work, and, and my voice is needed. I have to, if not me, then who? Um, I guess that's where I'm at now. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Hodan. So, did you want me to say the question again? Okay. How, how will you describe your life story? Uh, what brought you to the moment you live today? Well, thank you, Hakuna. Well, like so many of us, actually, we all have a similar background. Uh, we all refugee who end up uh, like so many other uh, refugees around the world. Uh, I was resided first in uh, California and then... Uh, in uh, Minneapolis, and you know, uh, at first we uh, uh, we used to when we used to go to high school, the only places that we go help or do homework or uh, it's the community places like you know uh, the African American community and other community uh, in in the neighborhood, and that's how I remember first. Those are the one who start helping us, and the little thing that you guys tell take granted, uh, like, like Hodan says, uh, we didn't know how to do that. So anyone and anybody who helped us will remember that. And any refugee, any refugee will do that. If you help them how to do homework or if you help them how to ride the bus. And so that's how we learn the community engagement. We didn't just learn and teach by a university or a civil engagement. We learn by the struggle of life. And that's how we... Uh, keep want to get back to our community. So at first, that, that's how I started, uh, you know, uh, helping my community. And uh, even when I started working in uh, corporate America, uh, I work one of the Fortune 500 companies like AT&T. I always volunteer for my community. And uh, in, uh, like Horan said, in 2016, that I become uh, the regional director of, uh, you know, DFL, Minnesota, Labor Party, uh, who most of us, I don't see any Republican here, but most of us were Democrat, so that's how we, <laughs> exactly. no. I'm assuming, yes, yeah. I hope so, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, that's, uh, you know. that was a life change for us, and as all, many of you know that our livelihood was actually, uh, um, it was kept threatening both verbally and we've seen it live. So it was actually a real struggle life for us because in a, in a, in a world that we come from, our freedom of speech is not allowed for the most part. And to see uh, that, you know, the, the, the country that we run to it, you know, threaten us our level, way of life, freedom of religion, the way we live, that was, that was a straight threat to us. And so many people uh, didn't realize this is real. It happened in long time ago, 1941 and semi. And, and we, 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 we understand that the struggle. So we were, uh, it was a very scary moment for us. And I was working 18, 16 hours a day. From Wilmer to St. Cloud to Minneapolis. And I was uh, having two hats. I was state outreach at the same time. Uh, East African Community uh, Director. So, uh, most for the most part, that's how I, uh, you know, in, that's how we involve the civil engagement, and that's the only way that you can change your community to empower, uh, empower the community. Is not only to run for office, but it's also so so many other things that you can do to help your community, and that's what got me today into it. 
Thank you, Shabdi. So, Mohammed, the so, question. You know the question, right? Yeah, so okay. uh, a little bit of how I ended up here. Um, to make it short, um, like my friends here, I, you know, my life uh, began in Somalia. I was born in Somalia. Uh, I left um, during the Civil War, and uh, I'm the oldest of five. So my family uh, fled uh, to Dadaab. Uh, we were there for, for a few years. As you know, Dadaab is the largest uh, refugee camp in the world. And so at that point, uh, my aunt who lived in New York City for, for many years, she came early in the 70s, had sponsored my family to come to the United States. And so I've lived in New York for a little bit and then came to uh, Minnesota uh, during my, my high school years. Graduated high school here and uh, went to University of Minnesota and did a, I went after manufacturing, engineering, and management uh, degree. And then right after that, I, I, uh, like my colleague here, I ended up in the corporate world. I was a project manager for a few years. And then at that time is when I really got involved in community work, public service. Uh, the reason uh, for that is because I saw in 2007, you know, there were many young people that I grew up with, you know, that were, I saw them, you know, them going off the wrong direction. And there was no leadership in the community at the time when it comes to young folks. Uh, there were, you know, the young people didn't have voice. They didn't have uh, leadership uh, to tackle some of these issues. And so a dozen friends of mine kind of gathered and started a, a dialogue in terms of how do we give back to young people at the time and how do we put them on a leadership level so that they can tackle some of these issues. And so as I was doing that with a few friends of mine, all of a sudden I started going off from the work that I have been doing in the corporate world and ended up in and really the industry that I, that I really fell in love with, which was giving back and, and, and tackling some of these big changes. And, and, and trying to really build a so society that I want to see uh, for the next generations, for many generations to come. Because the young people in the Somali community, guess what, they're not going home, uh, this is their home. Uh, they don't know, you know Somalia uh, that well at all. And so it's, it's very important for us to build a society that they see fit. You know, we want them to be the next, uh, the, president, the next president. We want them to be the next senators. Obviously we have a lot of folks that are uh, in office and or going to be in office. And so at the time for us was trying to create a, a systematic change and, and a pathway for young folks. And so what started a, a discussion to give young people uh, a chance to, to lead kind of took me over and, and I ended up uh, being uh, doing community work since 2007. It's really the best thing that that, that I ever did in my life uh, because it really, again, gives me a chance to really, uh, not, only, um, uh, not only do I get a chance today to travel around the world to, to build and help build the societies that I see built, but also, you know, I'm, I'm doing uh, uh, the kind of work that I love, which is creating the next leaders for not only for the Somali community, but for this great state of ours and, and then for this great nation of ours. And so, um, you know, being in the nonprofit, you know, I think is really the best industry there is. Uh, you're tackling different challenges every day, um, unlike the, the corporate world. And, and so it's, it's really, uh, it's something that, that, um, that I believe is, is the way to, to make change, uh, especially the climate that we are living today in the United States. People have to stand up you know, and, 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 and say exactly what's on my, their mind and, and tackle the issues that we really need to tackle at home and not, you know, uh, not listen, not really taking the leadership from others who are taking not only this uh, nation of ours on the wrong direction, uh, but really, you know, uh, alienating others from, from, uh, from the rest of us. And so, uh, you know, this is the right moment for us to, to really seek the change that we seek. Uh, but this is really my calling, uh, which is, you know, the public service and, and really giving back, which is within the nonprofit sector. Thank you, Mohammed. Just, just like uh, my colleagues here, um, you know, the coming to a new place where you don't know uh, what you're going to be encountering. 
So you, I landed first at JFK. Some of the things that we take for granted, like uh, Sheikh said, the immediate thing once you, the airplane lands, where do you go to? To the restroom, right? So I'm used to a different type of toilet system. So I go to the first one, the water is high. I find uh, maybe this is, something is broken in the, <laughs> with the bathroom. So I go to the next one, same thing. So I end up saying, nope, I'm gonna hold myself <laughs> until I go back to the plane because I was waiting for my plane to come back to, you know, to take me directly from JFK to Minneapolis. So those are the things that, you know, as somebody who's coming to a new place with limited English, sometimes you have to pay close attention to understand what is this person saying? You know, those are things that we take for granted. Uh, but when I look back, you know, the things like uh, when I came, um, it was uh, close to the winter. And the first thing as somebody who arrived in a new place and you see the snow coming down, what do you do? Anybody remember that? You go outside to, you know, put your thing out so you can test the, uh, the snowflakes. Um, so as soon as we arrived, I had, uh, you know, small pieces of clothes that never worked for me for the environment that I was walking into. To be warmly received by the uh, refugee services and others who, immigrant services who are welcoming us with warm clothes and telling us, welcome home. That was a very uh, emotional moment. You are putting a step in a different place. But then on my second day of arrival, as I walked around uh, the neighborhoods, I found myself lost. And as some of you know, I was on Lake Street and Chicago intersection. And that's my second day. You know, try to ask many folks who are standing around if they could direct me to my address, you know, where I was going. Everybody wasn't able to, you know, talk to me because the cops were coming. And as soon as they saw me talking to so many folks around that neighborhood, what do they do? Uh, they came with their lights on and everything. It's things that we see on the TV. You know, th this is the first thing that happens to you and you're being told, take your hands out of your pocket, empty your pockets, and it's my first time. You know, you feel shaken on my second day. And then I asked them, you know, I, you know, they asked for my ID, don't have much of an ID to show who I am. And then um, I asked them to help me because I wanted to find out, you know, I was lost at that moment, you know, directions, uh, somebody who doesn't know where you are, uh, you know, you are at that point. So I was left there without any help. And I was shocked, you know, this is something that I never expected. Uh, and so that encouraged me to seek uh, help from community members. The first thing that they told me is you can get a community ID from the Brian Cole Community Center which was actually the catalyst of receiving people who were newly arrived immigrants. Uh, I got my first ID from the organization that I became the executive director. You know, it helped me find uh, the housing that I wanted. It helped me find the education that I was seeking. And those are the folks that, who were able to understand me at that point where I was in my life. And finding that other folks who welcomed me and the community helping me, I found myself getting attached to that process. I started giving back, helping others who were also new to the process while I was helping myself. At the same time, the connection to the county agency was the second place. So I started helping folks and I became a county employee. Within the same process, I was engaged by my neighborhood organization. I became a board member, so getting more work to be done. And then I ended up uh, serving on the board of directors for my own neighborhood organization. And then within the same parameters, I got recruited to serve on the board of the same organization that I was helping that helped me. It never stopped there. The governor, Ventura, you know, uh, the governor can beat your governor. So he, he uh, initiated a program where 
were that he wanted someone of East African origin to serve on the Council on Black Minnesotans. That was the first opportunity. I was approached, and I didn't know how to say no. So I ended up becoming an advisor to the governor legislature through the Council on Black Minnesotans. That deeply encouraged me to start thinking about policy issues. And then, working at the county, everybody tells you the problem is with the state. Go work for the state if you wanted to fix the issues that you're facing right now. So I went to work for the state of Minnesota for more than 10 years, and everything that you hear, it's the legislature. You know, everything, it's the, the state, which is the problem. Um, but I ended up serving on the school board, you know, trying to understand the deep inside process of how our education system works with more than 36,000 students. And uh, that really encouraged me to push forward. And uh, in fact, I'd, I'd run for state senate. Can you imagine that? Someone who's new, has been here a few years, running uh, uh, for, to be a state senator. I lost narrowly on that uh, first initial uh, race, but I never gave up. You know, there's more to talk about it. And then I decided to challenge my own state legislature, who has been there for 42 years. Big division. You know, she has got folks within the community, folks who are in different areas. These are things that many people never expected. As a young immigrant who's new to the country, to challenge someone who has been there even before he was born. You know, this is something that it, even the paper, the Star Tribune, called it, we're calling it as ageism. It was not. It's things that we have to think about the new generation that we are serving, the new direction that we were going. So that helped me catalyze, and I ran again. I failed again. But I never gave up. Up to this moment in this last election cycle, this uh, primary uh, cycle that we were in, my state legislator who won, um, when Keith Ellison took the challenge to run for attorney general, she ran for the Congress, and she won. And she used to be my campaign manager in the previous run that I did. So I was encouraged, I said I will not give up because we need to have that voice of continuity. And I ran, and guess what? This time we won. So that is the trajectory that I took. So. Hopefully, hopefully uh, all of you will be participating in the general election, which is actually starting on Friday. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. And I wanted to say, you know, like, when the time you lost, the second day when you lost, did you forget your iron buck? <laughs> <laughs> so we can go to the next question. We have a lot of questions here, but um, let me go to the next question, and then um, let's keep it short. And... Mohammed, uh, it, it will be you now. All right. I think you talked about this, but let's see what you can say again. What, what was the failure you had? What did it mean to you? And how did it influence who you are today? You talked about that, right? Well, um, okay. I'll, I'll just, you know, they say the third time is the charm mm -hmm. on what I did in terms of running for the seat. But the, but the people who are behind you, who are supporting you with the family, with the community. Uh, I'm not only talking about the community that just looks like me, it's everybody. Knowing that failure is not the end of everything. That has inspired me to continue because I focused on the issues. You know, when we talk about success in education, we all have kids in schools, or we are ourselves uh, students, that has kept me going. And to continue running for political office and failing many times, many people will have given up a long time ago. Uh, some of them uh, compared me with uh, the previous uh, president who had run eight times, but I never reached the eighth time. So <laughs> this, the, the, the key issue uh, that I keep on telling people is if you put your mindset on making a difference and you do believe that you're going to succeed no matter what, never give up because that's how you succeed in life whether it's education, whether it's jobs, 
And from what I've learned from some of the CEO, uh, including Medtronic CEO and others from Target, what they'll tell you is, if you like to do something, do what you like to do. I've always liked engaging the community, making a difference for many people who don't have that opportunity, who don't have the time to do things that they want to do for themselves. So I want to become an example of others and say you can do it. So that's, that's something that I feel uh, we can all achieve. So uh, for me, when it comes to failure, a um, couple of things that I want to say. So um, in my current position, you know, I can tell you there's a lot of times in my lifetime that I have failed in many ways. Uh, but for me, the way that I look at these failures is not about how many times I failed at anything. It's about how many times that I failed at these things and I got up and I did it again. Um, you know, that is what differentiates you from other folks. You're going to fail no matter what. Failure is part of success. Failure is part of being a leader in anything, whether you're a president of the United States, whether you are in the leadership positions from, you know, that, that, that in my colleagues are in currently. Uh, they didn't get to this level. I didn't get to this level uh, because, uh, you know, that we failed one, you know, one time or two times. We learned from that. I learned from that. And so uh, for me, every time that I fail, it's a chance for me to reflect who I am and use that to better myself. Use that. To, it's, a, it, it's an educational moment for me. And that's what I teach the young people that I work with every day. Um, that's what I teach the, the, my, the colleagues that I work with every day. And so, yes, we are all going to fail. It's, it's part of, it's part of uh, human nature. But it's really about how you look at it. Um, and so it's very important that we look at that failure as a way to, uh, to get up and, and really use that to improve uh, each of us. Well, yes, I will do that. I will make it short since these two guys uh, make it long. <laughs> <laughs> well, like they say, uh, uh, failure is just is a life learning lesson. I mean, once in a every one of you guys fail, and like they say, is how you uh, look at it. If you sit down and, and say, well, I fell, I'm not going to do it again, then you're going to be a failure. But if you continue in your life, whether if you're going to finish education, whether if you're going to be, uh, like Mahmoud says, keep repeating again until you become house representative, well, that's how I look at it. It's just life, life is, it's a journey. And that journey, once in a lifetime, you will fail. But to continue to inspire people, you will have to continue and believe yourself that you can do it. I mean, for most people that is successful in the United States of America, once in a time, if you, if you read their story, I'm a reader, I read a lot of books, and if you read their stories or biography, they fail more than once. I mean, and that's how you can tell that those who fail and repeat it again become successful at the end. And that's who inspire me, that's the people that I uh, look out for me. Thank you. Well, I'm not going to sit here and say I have never failed like our president. Um, but I, I have failed multiple times, many times. Um, uh, the one thing that comes to my mind right away is first year of college. Uh, coming out of high school, I thought high school was easy. I'm like, okay, college is going to be easier. Um, I'm taking 16 credits. You know, the professor says, you can come or you don't have to come. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's here is the information that you need. Um, all, you know, lecture, uh, lecture and class discussion will be, will, exams will come from that. I'm like, shh. I can handle this, I can read the book. So I kept skipping classes, and then before you know it, I failed all 16 credits. And that was, like, I have never seen F in my life before that. So that was a reflection for me to just say, okay, all right, so I messed up. <laughs> you can imagine how my parents felt, you can imagine how, like, everyone in my life was upset with me, but I'm like, but I, I took the tests and I showed up class whenever, so, 
I don't know what happened, but I, I reflected on it. So one thing that, you know, helped me reflect on that better as, you know, as an 18, any 18 year old, there's not a whole lot of reflection going on up there. But one thing that helped me reflect on that better was that um, I always had a dream of becoming the first woman in my family to get a higher education degree. And I'm like, okay, so this is not gonna take me where I was going, so I better change something. So, and that was you know, a moment that helped me say, okay, so I'm going to class every day <laughs> from now on. I'm you know, reading the material and I'm staying awake. Um, so that, and, and, and I failed multiple times, but it's not, it's, if you're not failing, you're not trying. That's basically what it is. Uh, so anybody who says they haven't failed, they're not living life, so. I know you failed three times. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, especially to the young peop uh, people sitting out there uh, tonight, we, just gotta, we have to keep in mind that uh, a failure is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. And to an example, uh, the bill that I authored, I didn't know, I thought it would be easy, just think it would just go fast and I'll just give it to the senators, it'll come to a law. It never did. That was actually a teaching moment for me to change in my mind and be like, okay, I didn't fail. It was the bill that just got, didn't work because I need to put more work. So when you fail, it's not that you, it's time to give up, it's time to just put more work and make it happen. And that was actually the teaching moment that helped me to run for office and become uh, the first, the youngest uh, Minneapolis Park Board Commissioner in 130 years, and uh, the first uh, East African, Somali American, and the youngest Vice President of the Park Board in the city of Minneapolis. So, <laughs> it was that teaching moment that helped me, and now, there were times that I was just like you guys, you know, uh, kids who feel like uh, they, they have no space to see the change that they want to see. There was a time that I was advocating in my neighborhood to change, you know, the active pass, which is an idea in the city of Minneapolis where kids used to get into a park system. First time is free, but if they lose it, they have to be a dollar. And now, now I'm a voice for the, in the city of, the, the kids who live in our city of Minneapolis, now, next year, they won't have to pay that one dollar, and they'll get to use our park system for free without paying for a dollar, even if they lose their card. So the next question will be one minute each, but it's who is your hero and why? Who is your hero and why? Well, one minute. I think I have uh, so many heroes. But one of them, I think I can say Barack Obama was a hero for me. I worked his campaign in 2012, and I watched all his speech and how he inspired young people. Barack Obama is my hero, and he will always be my hero, and my president. Uh, my hero is a woman named Mokhtar Mai. She is a Pakistani woman who was gang raped in 2007 and I uh, was able to turn the worst of human behavior into something positive by advocating um, for um, women uh, gender justice in Pakistan uh, and has won so many awards. She was a woman who was illiterate but was able to, um, you know, was able to advocate for opening school under her name and then a center for women. Um, so that's my hero. So what is that name again? Mukhtar Mai and her book, uh, there was her autobiography was written, it's called In the Name of Honor. Well, how can, it's, it's very easy for me and my hero is my mom. Uh, I know a lot of people like, I like Obama, but I haven't, haven't met him. <laughs> <laughs> So you will meet him. Yeah. So my mom, my mom is the one who made me who I am today, and who inspired me, who teach me who I am, 
who teach me a lot of things that I could not learn from college. And that is run and write. This is what you do. This is how you behave. This is your, how you talk to your teachers. This is how you talk to the neighbors. It's my mom. That's, that's my hero. And uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for me, um, you know, I had the pleasure of, of, of meeting a lot of uh, my heroes in my lifetime. But the hero of, of all the heroes, uh, like my friend here, is my mother. Um, the reason being is I am who I am today because of her. I came from a single parent home. Uh, I'm the oldest of five, and it's not really easy. Some of the mothers here can tell you it's not easy to raise five kids. Uh, um, uh, you know, coming into this country in a new society, people get lost really, really fast. And so it's really my mother that really put us on the right direction. Um, she's the one that was there for, for me every night. And so she's the one, uh, you know, that, uh, that I look up to every night. So uh, she would be my hero. Uh, besides, uh my mom, uh, it's my wife, who, who really inspires me every day. She's a second grade teacher, and she's raising our four kids as I'm sitting here today. Uh, she's the one who's going to wake up early in the morning, uh, get them ready, uh, get herself ready to go to work. Um, so the challenges that she has been through, uh, it's something that to show that we need to appreciate uh, our wives, our mothers, and all the women uh, because you contribute more than any person that I can know of. So you make us and shape us who we are. And so I really appreciate um, as a society we need to be standing for all the women because of them we are who we are. So thank you so much. We will have a five minute break and then when we come back and we want to recognize uh, uh, more head candidates who are running uh, this year and also to engage the audience also to ask questions. So we'll have five minute break. <laughs> 